professor at Stanford. Oh yeah, I didn't write I'm at Stanford, but I, I'm I'm a professor at the university. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm a professor at Stanford, and um, this isn't my academic interest. I, I actually run a laboratory and, and do scientific research, but the, but I also take care of patients, and this has become uh, uh, sort of a, a second interest of mine because I think it's a very important topic, and I've I've started to I've been giving talks for several years on this issue because I think there are things that people can do about it. Anyway. So, uh, just to get started, um, I'm going to have some s reasonable amount of science in here, and there are two kinds of questions, and I think Kishore was talking to you about, you know, discussion type questions, but if I'm, if I'm giving the talk and I say something you don't understand, I think the best thing to do is to interrupt me right then and there, right, so that we, we get it clarified. And then the substantial questions for discussion, of course, we can wait till the end, but I, I really would like you to interrupt me if I say something you, don't, you just don't get. Okay, first slide. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm an oncologist when I'm not in the laboratory, and I see cancer patients, and there have been a number of really powerful drugs for cancer patients. Um, there are a number of drugs that actually target the tumors specifically. So instead of being general poisons, uh, these drugs actually have been designed to have very few side effects and to really just go after the tumor. And two examples are Gleevec, which is a kinase inhibitor uh, that acts against chronic myeloid leukemia. And almost everybody with this disease responds to Gleevec, and the side effects are really minimal, which is very different from conventional chemotherapy, where you throw up, your hair falls out, you get immunosuppressed, and so on. Another drug is Avastin, which is an antibody against vascular endothelial growth factor, it's made by Genentech, and it, it targets the blood vessels that grow into the tumor to nourish it. So these are wonderful things. Next slide, next button. And then there are some really great drugs that control chemotherapy side effects. One is called epigen, which is a red blood cell growth factor, and it, it, it stimulates uh, the, the production of red cells to combat anemia that often occurs during chemotherapy. Another is Nulasta, which helps restore the immune system. The white cells in your body uh, respond to this growth factor. And so if you've had conventional chemotherapy that suppresses your immune system, this can reverse that. So these are scientifically uh, very difficult things to get a hold of, but people research uh, unveiled the necessary science to get a hold of these drugs so that they can be made, and they really do help patients. Next slide. Now, what's happened is that um, even though a lot of these drugs uh, came about because of research, there have been some laws over the last 27 years that have actually affected pharmaceutical company behavior. The first was the Bayh-Dole Act, and the reason for, for this act was it was going to permit pharmaceutical companies to license NIH-funded research, because a lot of the breakthroughs were occurring in the universities. And what the government said was, we're not going to stand in the way, we're not going to demand uh, a, sh a split of the profits. In, or in order to encourage, even though we funded the research, in order to encourage universities to make partnerships with companies to bring the stuff to market, we're going to let you share in the fruit of our funding. Okay. So that, that actually had, was a law with very good intentions. Um, but what happened was uh, something that was unintended. If you push the button. In, in the old days, <clears throat> the pharmaceutical companies needed, like this grizzly bear, needed to find their own fish. And uh, they had very active research programs. Many of them still do. But as a result of this, because the flow could come out of the academic labs and the pharmaceutical company could simply license the ideas, this bear morphed into this bear. And, and so the behavior of the bear started to change um, because now the premium wasn't on making the discoveries yourself. You could license it. Next slide. 1984, another act, the Hatch-Waxman Act, also with very good intentions, exempted generic companies 
from repeating the clinical trials that led to the approval of the drug in the first place. So after a certain amount of time, when the patent runs out, generic companies are allowed to move in, and they don't have to prove all over again. They don't have to repeat all the clinical trials. They can just prove that their compound is chemically identical to what was used by the um, trade name company. And once they show they're chemically identical, then they can dispense with the clinical trials, which are very expensive, and bring out the drug at a lower cost. Now, an act like that actually needs some balance. And the balance was that the, the trade company said, well, we can't have people horning in if, in fact, they're horning in on us illegally. And so uh, there is a provision in the act that delays approval of the generic drug by 30 months if the brand name company sues to protect its patents because there might be some disagreement. The problem here is that the suit doesn't have to have any merit. There's an automatic delay of 30 months. So what's happened as a result is a lot of the drug companies have simply sued. Because if you've got a blockbuster drug that's making a couple of billion dollars a year, what's a few hundred thousand in lawyers' fees? 30 months. So this is, this is a problem because a lot of the generics have been delayed as a result of sort of this knee-jerk lawsuit thing. Uh, next slide. Now this is, all of you are, um, there's the Prescription Drug User Fee Act in 1992. Now this was interesting because prior to this, the FDA was known to be far more conservative than its European counterparts. Life-saving drugs were being delayed here in the U.S. Uh, much longer than they were in Europe. And the FDA said, well, that's because we don't have enough inspectors, enough scientists, we're underfunded. So Congress, instead of giving them more funding, came up with the bright idea of asking the drug companies to provide the funding by charging a half a million dollar fee for each FDA application. What happened as a result is most of the FDA is now funded by the drug companies it's regulating. Needless to say, the drug companies in paying this fee have demanded their money's worth. And what their money's worth has been is they've gotten very fast approval. And that's worked out really well to get really good drugs on the market quickly. But what the drug companies are not interested in is using this money to look at the safety of the drug after it's approved. So none of this money went for the safety of the drugs. So as a result, some drugs got approved. And then the safety came into question afterwards. And there's been no mechanism for monitoring that. Next slide. 1997, the FDA issued guidelines for TV ads. And you all know the result of that. There's been a proliferation of TV ads to ask your doctor about X drug. Next. In 2003, to help with elders who were having trouble paying for these very expensive drugs, this Medicare prescription drug benefit was passed. And it, it, it was interesting because one provision here, which was actually due to the lobbyists from the drug companies, was to prohibit Medicare from negotiating for lower prices. And as a result, the cost of these drugs is highest in the United States. It's much higher here than in Canada or any country in Europe. And so, as a result, people are going to other countries to try to get the drugs, and the administration has been trying to prevent people from going across the border, and, and the drug companies are very interested in not having that happen. But there's a huge skewing in the prices. One of my colleagues at Stanford is married to a woman from France, and every summer they go spend the entire summer in France, and uh, the whole trip is paid for because they buy their year's worth of drugs there, and they actually come out ahead. So, next slide. So how much money is involved? Um, colon cancer is the, the uh, um, disease that I treat the most often. And about 10 years ago, the standard of care was 5-fluorouracil and leucovorin. Survival at that time was about 12 months. Eight weeks of the drug cost $63. Then, aloxetin was added to that regimen. Survival increased by nine months. I mean, if you're going to die, nine months can be important. But the cost skyrocketed to $12,000. Avastin was added to that. You got another six months, and the cost went up to $21,000.
And the cost of these drugs has gone totally through the roof. And uh, that's good in a certain sense because it encourages the drug companies to come up with new drugs because there's so much profit to be made. But part of the problem is if you don't have adequate insurance, you won't be able to get these drugs. What was the time frame between the shift from 63 to 12,000? Um, this came online about six years ago. This came online about four years ago, three years ago. Yeah. Same patient is getting treated with very expensive drugs. Next slide. Okay, so how much money is involved? Well, the, in the Fortune 500, there are 10 pharmaceutical companies. Uh, their net profits are $36 billion. For the other 490 non-pharma companies in the Fortune 500, their net profits are $34 billion. So the profit margins are really big. The companies are really big. Some more numbers. CEO sal salaries plus stock options. This is uh, as of a couple years ago. CEO for Bristol-Myers Squibb made $151 million in one year. YF, $82 million. These are not off the wall. They're not extraordinarily high. Um, just to give you an example, Stanford Linear Accelerator down in the peninsula uh, employs hundreds of people, has a huge electricity bill. Their entire budget is $150 million. That's equipment, supply, everything. Uh, next slide. Next. So expenses versus profits. Where do they spend their money? Well, in their budgets, 35% is spent on marketing. When they tell you that most of the cost of the drug is research, it really isn't true. 11% uh, of the cost of the drug is research, and this isn't basic research. This is mostly clinical trials, either to get FDA approval or, much more often, to expand the market. By doing a clinical trial in a disease entity for which it wasn't approved, to see if you can get uh, more people to prescribe the drug. And the profit margin, on average, is 20%. And uh, the pharma industry kind of goes back and forth with the oil industry, depending on the price of a barrel of oil, about who makes the bigger profit. So Merck has had a reputation as being an absolute leader in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the African black fly. The African black fly, in its salivary glands, um, can sometimes hold a tiny little worm, a filarial worm. And next slide. And these are the filarial worms that live in the salivary gland of the glands of this fly. And if it bites a human being, the worms will migrate to the eye and cause what's called river blindness. And these are the areas in the world where river blindness is endemic. And it's probably the, it is the biggest, uh, biggest cause of blindness in the world. Very, very common. Next slide. The microfilaria can also uh, block the lymph node drainage of the lower extremities, for example. And what they'll do is they'll live in the lymph nodes which drain lymph. And so all the fluid from the lower extremities gets blocked up. And you get this tremendous <laughs> swelling of the leg and the scrotum. And that's called elephantiasis. Next slide. So Roy Vagelos, who was a scientist, was the chairman and CEO of Merck in this time period. Next. And during that time period, it was America's most admired corporation. I'm going through this history because you, your impression of Merck might be a little different right now. Next slide. In 1987, they were marketing a drug for uh, worms in dogs. And some of you who have pets may have used this drug. It's still being used. Does anybody use this? their dog. It's a deworming drug. Uh, a pill costs about two dollars. Next slide. Next slide. What they discovered was a single pill would cure river blindness and then they later discovered it would also cure elephantiasis. A single pill per year. Two dollars. So what Merck did is they did some research and they discovered that at two dollars a pill per year that was still too much. So they decided to make the drug for free, uh, available for free to anybody in those countries that I showed who had any human who had a need for river blindness or elephantiasis. And they set up a distribution network, all for free. They continued to charge dog owners in the United States for the drug. 
Next slide. Well, in 1994, Roy Vagelos retired, and Ray Gilmartin took over. And Ray Gilmartin came up through marketing. And he wasn't a drug company insider. He came from another industry. And the behavior at Merck started to change. I actually talked to him, because I asked him to come to Stanford to describe his experiences. And Roy Vagelos had a lot of stock options, and he didn't like Gil Martin. And so when Gil Martin took over, he, stole, sold, he sold off all his Merck stock. He just didn't like the guy. Next slide. And what happened was Merck started to really emphasize marketing, because that was Gil Martin's forte. And this is one of the examples of marketing. You may have seen this ad of Dorothy Hamill skating around on an ice rink talking about the wonders of Vioxx. If you typed in Vioxx in the old days, this is what you would get. Now if you type in Vioxx, you get the following. You get thousands of hits. <laughs> anyway, so um, you all know about that. Um, next slide. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the science of this. Um, there, there are two enzymes, COX-1 and COX-2, that stands for cyclooxygenase. And there are, these enzymes actually respond either to a physiologic stimulus, that's the COX-1 enzyme. Suppose you eat something, um, the COX-1 enzyme uh, comes on, and it, 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 it's involved in regulating platelets which make blood clots, and uh, it also helps protect stomach mucosal cells. Uh-huh. Is arachidonic acid a good thing or a bad thing if you eat it? Uh, arachidonic acid is a precursor to all the molecules that COX-1 synthesizes. So uh, arachidonic acid, there's a turkey here on a plate. So arachidonic acid's in your food. You need it to make these substances. All these substances are good because um, the COX-1 enzyme makes a whole bunch of substances that help, help you make blood clots, help you protect your stomach from digesting itself. These are good functions. The, the other thing is, sometimes you can hurt yourself. That's an inflammatory stimulus, you know. You rode your bike too hard, you, you fell, um, you played touch football. So you're, you're sore, and the COX-2 enzymes actually are responsible for the soreness because they make prostaglandins and inflammatory cells, and they contribute to pain, heat, and swelling in your joints. Okay, now those are normal responses, and they, they, they're kind of helpful, but sometimes they get in the way. And obviously, uh, you go and take an Advil or an aspirin. Uh, next punch. So if you take aspirin or naproxen, for example, um, that blocks both the COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes, and that really helps with your joint pains. But all, some of you know you have to be careful if you take na na these drugs because you can bleed more readily, and more, much more commonly, people can have problems with their stomachs. Okay. So, what Merck did was they discovered, next, they, they, they went on a search for a drug that would knock out COX-2 and leave COX-1 alone. So you wouldn't have any problems with your stomach, you wouldn't have any problems with bleeding, but you just knock out the pain. So that's ideal. Next slide. Next slide. And annual sales were three and a half billion. This was their big money maker. Three and a half billion a year. Next. Well, it turns out COX-2 also has another function. And it, it's in blood vessel endothelial cells. And these cells make substances that prevent blood clotting. And what happens is blood clotting is sometimes good and sometimes bad. If you cut yourself, you want to clot. But if you're exercising, and you're stressing your heart, you don't want a clot to form in your coronary arteries. And so there's a balance between making blood clots and preventing blood clots from being made. And what happens is that if you knock out, next slide, if you knock out just, if you use Vioxx just to knock out COX-2, right, you're going to knock out the system that prevents blood clots, but you're not doing anything to the system that makes blood clots. So the balance between making and preventing blood clots has shifted as a result of using Vioxx. This was known when they were making, 
when they were actually developing Vox. This was a theoretical possibility. <clears throat> but you can see that the problem could be heart attacks, obviously. Next slide. So that's the question. Could Vioxx cause heart attacks? No one would have the guts to do such an experiment to answer that question. Um, but the experiment was done, unfortunately. Next slide. And it turns out, th this is an article from the Wall Street Journal, which is not exactly a bastion of radical firebrand people. <laughs> this is the Wall Street Journal. Email suggests Merck knew Vioxx's dangers at an early stage. Next. So this is Elise Ryson, VP for Clinical Research at Merck. She said the clinical studies should be designed so the risks, meaning the risk of heart attack, would not be evident. They knew theoretically this would be a problem. So when they designed the clinical trials, they purposely excluded anybody with any significant risk of getting a heart attack because they didn't want a whole bunch of heart attacks to appear in their study. Next slide. So this is the study that was published. It's in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the most prestigious journal. And, and as a result, of course, this is a boom for marketing. Because all the pharma reps now get reprints of this journal article and pass it out to the doctors, because this is the imprimatur, the New England Journal. right? Now, buried in this article, though, was a number of heart attacks, even though patients were being excluded. Now, if you were going to design a study for a drug like this, I think ethically you might want to design it to exclude people who have a risk of heart attacks, because after all, you're a little worried about that. But the problem is they didn't market it to that population, right? The population had very low risk for heart attacks. They wanted everybody to take it. That's how they, they got the sales up to three and a half billion. So they designed the study in what you might consider an appropriate way, but then they followed up with very aggressive marketing. Next slide. Next. So when that paper came out, some physicians who read the fine print started getting worried, and they started asking questions about the side effects. And Merck responded with an instruction manual called Dodgeball Vioxx. And what they did is they had a number of 16-page manual. They had a number of physician questions that you could expect if you were a pharmaceutical rep. And then they, they gave sample answers for what the rep should say. And each answer was labeled with the word dodge. Wow. Next slide. Gurkhapal Singh was an assistant professor who was in the speaker bureau. He was paid money to give talks on behalf of Vioxx. Well, and actually the money's pretty good. $5,000 for a one hour lecture. It's more than I'm getting here. It's about $5,000. Actually, it's about $5,024 because I had to buy dinner. So, um, he started getting worried and he started criticizing the missing safety data. So Merck immediately fired him from the Speakers Bureau because when you get up and give a talk, there's a pharma rep in the back taking notes on what you say. And when he started doing this, he got fired. He didn't get his money anymore. Um, but Merck decided to threaten Stanford. And they called his boss at Stanford, who was the head of the rheumatology division, and said, you know, we're going we're gonna to pull all our research funding, funding for rheumatology if you don't get this guy to shut up. Next slide. They play hardball. <laughs> So what did the chair of do? Um, uh, he called the newspapers and called uh, the CEO of Merck. <laughs> what year was that? Uh, it, it was around a little bit after the time the paper came out. Yeah, 2005, somewhere in there. So um, what happened after this all hit the news is Richard Horton, who's the editor and publisher of The Lancet, which is up there with the New England Journal as a really prestigious medical journal, wrote this. In a recent editorial, we commended Merck for acting promptly in the face of new findings of the safety of Vioxx. That's when they withdrew the drug. And all this stuff started to come out. They immediately withdrew the drug from the market. But then all these other things started leaking out. Our praise was premature. Merck and the FDA acted out of ruthless, short-sighted, and irresponsible self-interest. 
that's kind of, that's really strong editorial content there, um, from a very staid journal in England. Next slide. Well, um, what happened was the clinical trials uh, showed an increase of risk of heart attacks for Vioxx when compared to naproxen. I'll show you uh, slides here. Um, um, I'm, I'm going to give you a crash course on statistics first. But um, what happened was, even though the clinical trials showed this, uh, this, was, this, was the, uh, this was not the placebo, this was the control arm. What the article said was that maybe Vioxx isn't dangerous, maybe it's just that naproxen protects against heart attacks. <laughs> and, you know, theoretically that could be possible, but there was absolutely no evidence in the literature to suggest that was true. So it was kind of a manufactured thing. Um, it was a spin. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you a crash course on statistics now. P-value means the probability that the result could have occurred by chance. And for physicians, a p-value of less than 0.05 means that a result you see is likely to be meaningful, right? There's less than 1 in 20 chance that this difference between two groups could have occurred by chance, right? For example, if I look out the room and look at how many males and how many females, and there are more women here than men, is that significant or not? You can do statistics to determine that. And if the statistics say the p-value is greater than 0.05, then it just happens to be who showed up, right? That's a difference in groups. Example, in a study of 1,000 patients comparing drug X to drug Y, say heart attacks occurred in eight patients on X and three patients on Y. Next. The p-value there would be 0.22, because the numbers here are pretty small, only eight patients and only three patients. Right? And this is not a significant difference, even though 8 is greater than 3. If it were 80 and 30, I can guarantee you that would be different. But if only a couple of cases change, 8 patients versus 1 patient, look what happens to the p-value, 0.04. I'm telling you this because a little bit of massaging of the data, not all out and out cheating, can change a p-value here to here, or, or actually go from here to here, if you don't want heart attacks to make the headlines in an article you're writing. Because heart attacks were the big problem. Okay, next slide. Next. Okay, so now we know a little bit about p-values. Just hold that in your head. What, um, <coughs> between 1999 and 2003, um, there were a total of 16 trials using Vioxx. Every one of these trials, by the way, was sponsored by Merck. A fact of life now in the United States is, if you want to do a trial looking at a drug, nobody has any money to do it except the drug companies. So the drug companies are paying for the trials for their own drugs. Um, if the trial put you on Vioxx for more than six months or less than six months, the relative risk of getting a heart attack was still about twofold. And so there's no difference between whether you were on Vioxx for a long time or a short time. This is significant because when Merck withdrew the drug, they said that you had to be on Vioxx for a really long time in order to get a heart attack. But this is their data. So they knew they were lying. Now, here's another thing. Eight of the 16 trials had what's called an independent endpoint committee. This is a group of people who don't work at Merck to look at the data and try to see what's in the data. If you had a trial like that, these eight trials, the relative risk of getting a heart attack when you're on Vioxx was almost fourfold. In eight of the other trials, the other half of the trials sponsored by Merck, there was no independent endpoint committee as far as we could tell. That means it's very likely that the people looking at the data worked for Merck. The relative risk of getting a heart attack when you were on Vioxx was 0.79. It was actually good to be on Vioxx. <coughs> now, could that have happened by chance? What's the p-value? 0.01. Less, about one chance in 100. So that difference is not random. Something is happening. Why is the data here different from here? 
Why would Merck ever allow that to happen? Why would you ever have an endpoint committee? The reason is, if you want to get published in the New England Journal of Medicine, you have to prove to the editors that you had an independent endpoint committee, because they, they won't publish your paper otherwise. But if you do, the data changes very significantly. Next slide. Are those the same eight trials that they looked at? No. No, because if you have an independent endpoint committee, you're stuck. So they, they sponsor lots of trials. Yeah. OK, so remember I said that, that in that other paper, Merck claimed that naproxen had a protective effect. That was a big, high-profile paper. As a result of that paper, a huge number of people went out and tried to figure out if naproxen was protective. That would have been great. So a large number of clinical trials, boom, 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 every one of these is a clinical trial on naproxen that was spawned by that paper. That paper's claim that maybe naproxen was protective. Everybody wanted to know the answer. Now, the way this graph works is, if, the point, if, the, if these points fall to this side of the line, that means naproxen is protective. If they're on that side of the line, the placebo control or whatever else the control is, wins. Okay? If you're right on this line of one, Napherson has no effect whatsoever. The size of the box refers to the size of the study, the number of patients in the study. These are the error flags. These are the uncertainties in the data. Okay? So you can see on average, most of this stuff is falling right here. There are several studies over to the left that seem to favor Napherson. Right? I'll tell you which ones were sponsored by Merck. <laughs> Next. Okay, next. Here's another paper by Liss et al. for the Advantage Study Group. This was a uh, what's called a phase four trial to try to expand the market for Vioxx. Next slide. So Alex Berenson, reporter for the New York Times, wrote, evidence that Vioxx shows intervention by Merck officials. Next. List it all reported heart attacks in five patients on Vioxx compared to one patient on Naproxen. The p-value for that was 0.22, so it really didn't make it into the abstract. Next slide. What Berenson did was, he looked at the data officially filed at the FDA, and there were heart attacks in eight patients on Vioxx compared to one in Naproxen. So there was a discrepancy in the data that was published versus what was registered at the FDA. And the p-value would have been 0.04. That would have made it to the abstract as a big deal. So why did what happened? What happened to the data? So he started digging around. Elise Rison asked for a new email. You know, she should really scrub her email. I would prefer unknown cause of death so we don't raise concerns. Jeffrey Liss was the first author of the paper. He's a full professor at University of Arizona. He supposedly wrote the paper. When Berenson interviewed him, he said, he was unaware of the altered diagnoses. And he said in his own defense, Merck designed the trial, paid for the trial, ran the trial, the initial paper was written in Merck, and just sent to me for editing. But he was willing to put his name on the paper. And he was being paid by Merck as a consultant, a highly paid consultant. So, so if you want to look for villains, there are a lot of villains. Next slide. Next. So just as summary, number of deaths attributable to Vioxx, Vietnam, American deaths in Vietnam, and American deaths in Iraq as of a few days ago. Next slide. So where were the problems? Well, obviously, Merck officials, some of them just altered the data in minor ways just to make things come out right. And they designed the trials to conceal the risks. Next. Academic physicians, quote, authored key papers. They didn't really, obviously. And they delivered continuing medical education, which are usually around very lavish dinners at very fancy restaurants. Next. And then the FDA. They failed to monitor the safety of bios. Next. So is the medical literature biased? Ghost writers and research papers. This was a, a survey where they asked the authors of research papers anonymously whether there was a ghost author who actually wrote the paper. So let's look at the most prestigious journals, New England Journal of Medicine and Annals of Internal Medicine. 
of these articles were ghostwritten. 26% in the New England Journal. Now, not all the articles in the New England Journal are big studies. A lot of them are little case reports or little scientific things that obviously drug companies have no interest in. <laughs> so, this is a really a much higher percentage than it appears. Randomized myeloma trials favoring a new drug. If you're going to do a randomized trial between a new drug and the standard of care, you better give the right standard of care, right? And in fact, the reason you're randomizing is because you really don't know what the result would be. And your expectation would be that when you do a randomized trial, half of them will come out one way and half will come out the other way. Because that's the only way you can ethically do a randomized trial. Next slide. When it was not sponsored by industry, the new drug was favored 47% of the time, 50-50, just as you would expect. What happens when it was sponsored by industry? How did it come out? Next. So, next. All right, so this is, this is Lucy, psychiatric help, five cents. Next. So, antidepressants are not five cents anymore. There are 5,000 with lots of zeros. Okay, next. So can we fix the problem? So one thing I think we need to do is we need to have financial disclosure. When somebody like me comes up to give a talk, by the way, I have no conflict of interest. I'm not being paid by the drug companies. Um, a lot of people get up and give talks and don't disclose that the talks they're giving about the drug uh, are being manufactured by somebody who's giving them consulting fees. Next. The other thing is that if you're going to do a clinical trial, um, what we want them to, people to do is to uh, companies to do is to register at clinicaltrials.gov, because what they what the practice has been is to sponsor a large number of clinical trials and just publish the ones that come out the way you want them to, and not publish the ones that came out the wrong way. But if you're forced to register, then you can go back and see what happened. And so this is, the journal editors are now asking for this as a precondition for publishing anything. What happened is, then the company started registering the trials, and many of them, many of the more notorious ones, Merck included, um, failed to register the primary endpoint for the trial, meaning the purpose of the trial. They would just leave it blank. So you couldn't tell any. And then the drug would be some number. And so they could claim they registered, but there's no way of tracking anything. So, so what's happened as a result is people have done analyses to see which companies registered properly or not, and then they publish their results. And so by shining a light on this, there's been more and more compliance. So we're hoping that that continues. Next. Um, ban pharma reps from academic medical centers. Ban them from doctor's offices, which we can't do. At Stanford, we banned them in the, uh, last year. Starting this year, we, they can no longer come onto the medical school campus. Next slide. And then, try to figure out a way to get drug trials done in an unbiased way. When, when you say they, they're banned from the medical They can't campus. come to our campus. But is that circumvented by the fact that they could just meet off campus? Or yeah, and they're doing that. They're inviting our young residents and fellows for lavish dinners. So wouldn't it be a better ban to have the doctors sign off that they can't meet, period? Well, yeah, I prefer that. Okay. <laughs> I prefer that. I, I, I think it's a, um, yeah, I mean, there are different levels that you can go to. Um, it's interesting, it was hard enough to ban them in the first place, but now everybody's kind of gotten used to it. And we actually find that there are more seats in lecture halls, and um, <laughs> they, they, they used to uh, lie in wait outside the clinic, and you have to run this gauntlet of pharmaceutical reps. <laughs> And they were just getting in your way. So it's kind of nice not having them. But yeah, it, it would be nice. It, you know, there's things, issues of personal freedom and things like that. I mean, I don't tell you what to do on your off hours. And, and I don't think I'd want anybody to tell me what to do. So it, it's, it's within the, the scope of the ethical responsibilities yeah, of, yeah. The, of the doctor treating the patient. Yeah. Especially with the studies. Attitudes so could change. So That's what yeah. I'm It'd be nice to change attitudes. That's why I didn't talk. Uh -huh. um, besides their stock tanking, was there any repercussions for these Merck peoples who 
Well, they've I've won some lawsuits it. and they've lost some. And anybody who knows about jury trials can predict what's been happening. They've been winning about half and losing about half. Because jury, juries, when they deliberate, obviously with the same data, <laughs> uh, often come out different, differently just depending on dynamics. So they are losing money on lawsuits. But the people themselves can't be held accountable? For yeah, money. that's an interesting thing. Like, what about Elise Rison? I mean, she yeah. Yeah, that's okay. yeah, shouldn't she be in jail? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my opinion. Uh, How would you suggest that the unbiased drug trials take place? That is very problematic. Um, because the National Institutes of Health doesn't have enough money. So, how do you, how do you structure that? Um, some people have proposed that if you want your drug approved, you have to contribute to a fund, yeah. and then referees will take proposals from investigators on how to test the drug and, and award the contract to the best proposal. Well, that's a wonderful idea, but I don't think it's going to happen. The biggest lobby in Washington is the pharmaceutical lobby. Um, it may, you know, things like that may start to happen. Uh, clearly, clearly, it's very dependent on who occupies the White House. Because uh, an amazing thing, I was watching this um, during the Kerry Bush election. When, no, no was it Kerry Bush? Which was the Florida? Uh, I, mean, I mean, it was 2000, it was Gore. It was Gore, 2000, Gore. Um, it w in 2000, it, when Florida was going back and forth, it turns out that if you were watching the stock market, you know how CBS announced that Gore won? The pharmaceutical uh, stocks tanked. Mm. And then when they reversed the decision, they, they skyrocketed. Mm. And, and depending on, on how the networks were announcing who was going to win, clearly the investors knew who was going to tilt in which direction. You know, investors are cold-blooded. They, they know. Before we take another question, um, does anyone have any questions about the presentation? Because then we can turn off the uh, projector. Oh, so give me another. Let me see if there's anything else. I think that's it. Uh, sure yeah, that's it. Actually, I did have a question about the presentation. Um, I just want to go back to that clinicaltrials.gov? Yeah. Um, yeah, you can type in there and you can go look. Yeah, because I'm actually just on there today. Oh, good. Brought that up. But I was wondering if there is requirements for companies to uh, keep updating the trials that they do register. Because I noticed a lot of them said, oh, like, still open ended, like, results not in. Oh, results not, that, yeah, results not in is probably true. Yeah. They failed to report their results. This isn't register. a law. <clears throat> so. It's not a law to register in clinicaltrials.gov. What's happening is, Journal editors are saying we won't publish your paper unless you're there, and you know there's been push from different points of view, but it's not an absolute law that you register and you register properly. It's not like filing your income taxes. But you could just register and say, oh, we registered, yeah. and never report yeah. the results if you don't. Yeah, but people have been analyzing the registrations and then publishing the results of which company is acting badly or or not badly. It's kind of like Wikiscanner for Wikipedia. <laughs> you know, you can change any entry in Wikipedia, but Wikiscanner kind of makes keeps things honest. It it publishes who who did the change. You know, for if you type in Exxon, uh, the fact that the oil spill is mentioned at all, it turns out to be a big deal because a bunch of Exxon servers ended up. Editing that out, but Wikiscanner discovered that, and you know, oh my God. came back in. So I think shining a light on things is a big help, but it's not a law yet. One good thing, one good thing, as of the end of September, Congress passed passed a law giving the FDA funding to look at the safety of drugs after they've been approved. They also gave FDA, believe it or not the power to require drug companies to admit that a drug wasn't safe. Believe it or not, prior to that law, they had to negotiate with the drug company. They couldn't, they were not empowered to require the drug company to put a safety warning on. They had to ask the drug company if they would please do it. 
So that law is now in effect. The problem is, the Bush administration has pretty much said they weren't, they're not going to enforce large parts of it. So we're going to have to see how that plays out. Uh-huh. Um, it sounds like you're talking about one side, the government would be really good if you know, they had strong laws to hold down the pharmaceutical companies and keep them honest. And then the other side I'm hearing you talk about, free press is being the kind of way to hold it down. The advantage of the press is that they're not so affected by the administration in charge of the government. The government, in fact, all the matters of the government is money too. The press, for some reason, doesn't seem to be as effective. Is it, when you're, when you're seeing what's working, would you say overall uh, more engaged press is where we would want to push that efforts to control pharmacy? Or would you say ultimately we're not going to get the real results we want until we get some sort of government structure and some sort of license? I, I think it's going to have to be a combination of the two. I, I think an industry like the pharmaceutical industry has to be regulated by an agency like the Food and Drug Administration. There is no there is no way the press can dig into this stuff. These are very technical matters, right? You, you have to have unbiased scientists looking at it in great detail. Um, it, it is a, it, even, the, even the pharmaceutical industry would argue, would not say you do away with the FDA, we can sell whatever we want. It's just, it's on, you can't do that. But you have to have an FDA that's actually functioning properly. And in the last decade or so, the FDA has ceased to function properly. And there's a huge morale problem at the FDA, gigantic, because um, what's happened is that the guys in the trenches are being told to act a certain way from above, because the higher, you know, the higher ups are political appointees. So um, there has been a huge morale problem, um, but Congress has looked into it and tried to figure out ways of of righting the ship. Clearly, the FDA is now put on notice because. They've gotten a lot worse publicity than they ever wanted. But you have to have you have to have the FDA. Yeah. Let me uh, ask a question to expound upon the FDA role in this, uh, and that's uh, what do, what do they test on a clinical trial? Really simply, because you talked about how the FDA has now been given the right to test long-term health effects. So what? Uh, no, they're not. They, they're not. They're not given the funding to do the clinical trial. They're, they've given the funding to look at the data. The clinical trial will, will still be done by the drug companies. So what's um, the clinical trial? But, but what the FDA does do, what they can do, though, is they can hire epidemiologists to look at government databases. Right? Medicare databases show who's had a heart attack and who's on which drugs. And, and they can get databases from Kaiser Permanente and so on. So they can do some of that sort of retrospective analysis by epidemiology, but they can't do the clinical trials. They don't have that kind of money. That's huge amounts of money. So can we go back to the bears? Bears, yeah. The bears at the beginning. To so I understand the paper trail, the NIH funds the, the research development into these drugs, pours millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars into that. That research then gets given to these corporations? See, the NIH budget is about uh, 10 billion a year, roughly for extramural. Uh, 12. 12 billion. 12 billion, just to put it in perspective. Outside. Yeah, so, you know, 12 billion, this is all, all external research all over the country outside of Bethesda, Maryland. Viax makes three and a half billion. Lipitor makes about five billion. Just a couple drugs. So the NIH budget isn't real big, but it's very effective. But I think the question was, is the NIH giving it to the research, to the drug companies, and no, it gives it to the university. Oh yeah, and it, it gives it to the, the professors like me <laughs> <laughs> to do the research, and then. But what happens, at which stage does that research then move into the drug companies and what do right, they think? Right, so, so, okay, so suppose I do some research and I, I invent something new. Well, what Stanford can do at that point is take a patent out on it, okay? And um, they encourage me to, to help them write the patent because they said they'll share some of the royalties with me. And then they try to market the patent to industry. 
and industries that can buy a license for the patent. What is the marketing? What part of the university? Uh, the technology licensing office. You know, the they'll, they'll actually write little emails to, to their contacts and say, we've got this invention, we've got this new thing, process, whatever. So just to, just to follow this through, so Stanford will then li license research on a drug like Biox to, or a drug platform like Biox to industry. Right. So in fact, Stanford will also be making a huge amount of money from oh, yeah. Biox as oh, well. Oh yeah. So even the research institutions don't seem to be very well aligned to disprove the, the, the credibility or viability of their drugs, correct? I mean, the drivers aren't very well... No, the, the research university, actually, once we sell the license, suppose, for example, the discovery could have been the molecular pathway that was attacked by Vox, right? Yeah. Once we do that, we don't run the clinical trials, we don't see the safety data, we don't... Right. We're not aligned. We, right. But, but is there a revenue stream attached to that license? Absolutely. So there Millions even, of dollars. So even if someone in your university wanted to do studies against a certain drug. It might hurt the university. Yeah. yeah, but you know, it, it, you know the interesting thing about a university, if you talk to anybody who's been a department chairman or a dean, is faculty don't listen to you. <laughs> they, they are really, really just scruffy people who don't, who don't take supervision very well at all. So I, I don't think there's, it's very hard to get university professors to do what you're bidding, just because you, you know, one arm of the university is making a ton of money. <laughs> but but, yeah. but, but honestly, that doesn't buy my, my, my no, sense of... Uh, no, but, but the university, I think what you're worried about is, shouldn't the university have a responsibility to publicize the problems? Because yeah. yeah. they're making some money out of it. Right, because the yeah. whole supply chain seems to be tainted by yeah. it. Right from, right from the government, the FDA, right at the beginning, being funded by these drug companies. The universities doing the drug development platforms and the follow-up studies potentially being yeah. funded by the yeah. drugs to the drug companies it's themselves. A, it's a little more, this, you know, the scientists at the bench, it's a little more subtle. The part I don't like is the university professor who's an expert in arthritis going out and giving talks trying to sell biops and getting paid a bundle. That is a real conflict. That's huge. Uh-huh. I wonder if I could just add something on also at Stanford and the, the the licensing works sort of in some the way that it got started at Stanford was people invented the laser and they could license it to people who use it for medical devices and people who use it for weapons and this and that. So they actually never made any of those products but they discovered the laser. And it's the same thing like if you're doing the basic biotechnology, you don't discover product at all. You discover you know, like how DNA damage gets repaired, which Gil works on. And if somebody thought, oh, we might be able to use this to make a drug, you know, that's something way beyond the capacity of the university ever to do. But just the idea to do that, then it's going to be years and the company does it. So the scientists can end up really distanced from the actual yeah. data on the clinical trial because it might be so removed in terms of what gets done with it later. I know, I think he's making an ethical, moral argument rather than a true legal responsibility. Um, I used to be a physicist, for example, and we physicists have a black mark on our name because we basically invented thermonuclear devices. And um, physicists actually, as a group, have this legacy on their conscience. And uh, they have become extremely activists about certain you know, a large group of physicists actually are very active about speaking out about the fruits of their inventions and not having them used for harmful purposes. Yeah. And people like Edward Teller, physicist who was speaking out in the opposite direction, are actually held in great disdain by the majority of physicists because they feel that he, he shirked his moral responsibilities. So, I mean, you're making a point, um, but, but it's not a legal point. It's, I think it's a moral, ethical issue. And I, I think it is true that that people at universities have a moral, ethical um, responsibility to go out and engage the public and talk to them about these issues. Let's, yeah. let's take two more before we'll take a break. Uh -huh. So do does industry have their own scientists who are creating ideas from that base level? <coughs> Merck. 
never completely dismantled their scientific enterprise. <coughs> and um, I, I think of a lot, a lot of the new products from Merck came from their own labs now. Um, they just came out with a vaccine against cervical cancer. And I think a lot of the basic work for that came from their labs as far as I know. Um, so they're going to continue making their own things. Of all the pharmaceutical companies, Merck has the, the strongest scientific core. So they are still doing things. But many of the other drug companies don't know. Genentech, for example, I don't think they're no, they're no longer just a biotech startup, obviously. They're a big pharmaceutical company. And they're very committed to science. And they find a lot of these things on their own. But they also they also license them. Rituxan, they, they license from another company and so on. Um, I was just wondering if you could comment on how the EU might regulate um, some of these drugs in the FDA, particularly with regards to once the drug's been approved out there, whether there's any further regulation as compared to your Oh, that's a, that's a really great question that I'm afraid I don't. For safety, I don't, under, I don't know what, what happens in Europe in terms of safety monitoring. I, does anybody here know? I, I don't. I do know that in terms of drug pricing, the European countries have a lot of leverage because many of them have huge national health care systems, and there's a huge amount of leverage in terms of negotiating a better price. But I don't know about the safety monitoring that goes on, what their mechanism is in detail. I should look, I should look into that. Um, we could learn some things maybe from them. Well, on that note, let's take a, a five to ten minute break. Uh, you guys can go ahead and get uh, refreshments, go to the restroom. We'll give Dr. Chu just a couple minute break to recover his voice. And then we'll come back here and lead off with questions. And I encourage you to start thinking about how this affects me personally. A lot I noticed a lot of the questions about the regulatory industry and uh, the oversight and I encourage you, if this affects you personally, to ask questions from the personal side of the story. And maybe you're on a drug and you have questions about what well, the same Actually, reason. given your ages, most of you may not be affected, but you have parents mm -hmm. who are definitely affected. Okay, so we'll see you in, in five minutes.